steps, of course, it's, it's very simple, but uh, Nehemiah 8.8 8 says, here's what needs to happen. Nehemiah 8.8 8 says, they read from the book from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. Now, we have lots of resources today that were not available to the people of Israel in Nehemiah's day. Uh, but the, the primary resource is the local church. That's the primary resource to understand the Word of God. And in the local church, God has said that He will, uh, well, Christ gives gifts, and included in that are pastor teachers. Thank you. And so we need to be able to read. And we need to be able to get the sense of it. And you get assistance from that in the local church. <clears throat> uh, Brian, if you could go to slide uh, 17, I believe. And we're reminding ourselves. <laughs> okay, keep, yeah, that's. Okay, keep going. Okay, right, right, right there is a good place. Remember, we're reminding ourselves of questions to ask. Um, when, we read a, when we read a text, there are questions we need to ask. This, both of these sheets can help you answer these questions. Okay, perfect. This uh, New Testament book summaries, it helps to know what kind of book are you reading, where... where from what type of book are you reading? In the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are Gospels. Now, if you want to make a little note of this, three of them, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called the Synoptics. The Synoptics, and that means they are, that word optical, optic, they are seen, and soon means together. Synoptic, taken together because they're very similar. There's lots of parallel passages between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And uh, they have, they are each distinctive. Uh, there are different themes in each of the three, but they, they're very similar in that they are presenting the ministry of Jesus. The book of John is much more uh, of a, a theological case for the person of Jesus. And it was written later. But still, those are the four Gospels. You've got the book of Acts, the history. Uh, you know, in our Bible, sometimes it says the Acts of the Apostles, but could probably more accurately be titled the Acts of the Holy Spirit uh, as he leads the followers of Jesus. Then we've got the epistles, which are letters. And uh, Paul wrote 13 of these, at least. Um, uh, then you have the general epistles in there, too, which are are written really not by Paul that kind of covers everything else but um, then you have the the book of Revelation prophecy the future of the church uh, and, and I would just say God's f total future program is involved in that so it helps to know what you're reading and this little sheet can get you started a great step in the right direction because a lot of people think of the Bible as just uh, a single book of religious instruction when actually it is the revelation of God uh, of himself to us so that then we're exposed and we see who we are and we understand the only possible way we could be right with him but it's through these different uh, types and categories of literature it's necessary that we know about Jesus it's necessary that we understand what difference that made to the original hearers uh, and to, uh, to how, how do we get here? How, do, how did this happen? Um, and then the instruction about the Christian life in the epistles and what's to come in, in uh, Revelation. So that, that helps. You've got to remember what you're reading there. The other handout you have that helps answer these questions, figures of speech figures of speech. Uh, on one side, the side that looks like this, not so much the chart, this is a kind of a uh, grammatical aid for you. So a figure of speech is an expression. Um, 
like a metaphor or hyperbole in which the literal meanings of words are distorted to create vivid or dramatic effects. Um, we, we know these, but just but if you look down through there, look at, uh, well, let's just read some of these. Rule, rule 3.1, use the literal sense of the text unless there is some good reason to believe it should be taken as a figure of speech. All right, now listen. You may want to circle that. In the history of Christian hermeneutics, this is the issue. How ready are you to say that something is a symbol rather than something to be taken literally? Let me give you an example of that. We've got a cross on the wall and on the front here. Why do we have a cross? What do we believe about the cross? For Christ died and secured our salvation. Christ died on the cross, without which there'd be no salvation, right? Okay, so did he, did he literally die? Did a person named Jesus actually physically get nailed to a cross and physically expire? Yes, sir. Okay, do we believe that he's still dead? Okay, the resurrection. Do we believe that the same person that was, uh, that ki was killed on the cross three days later rose from the grave defeating death literally bodily? Do we believe that? Okay. There are Christians. There are lots of Christians who say that is figurative. Um, I, I, I've probably told y'all this several times, so forgive me, but it's the best illustration I know of that I heard with my own ears. Around Easter one year, not too many years ago, there was a special on either the History Channel or the Discovery Channel, and they had assembled some Bible scholars, you know, from, uh, they had this uh, one guy, he was a, he was a Roman Catholic priest and a seminary professor. And uh, uh, they had another lady. She was a professor in some seminary. They were talking about how important the resurrection is. But then when they were asked, but did it happen in space and time? One of them said, um, well, if, if the disciples had been all excited and they had gathered everybody around after Jesus' resurrection to take a picture and you got the picture back and looked at the picture later, later, you would have seen Peter and you would have seen Mary Magdalene and all that bunch, but where they thought Jesus was, there would have just been an empty space. <coughs> because he really wasn't there. He, he rose in their hearts. Okay. <laughs> well, he's, he's certainly alive and dwelling in our hearts, but he would not be there if he did not bodily come out of the grave. Uh, they did not experience a group or mass hallucination. They didn't just go along with each other and decide, but we love him so much he still lives from our perspective. And, uh, you know, Paul addressed this to make sure that biblical Christianity is not faith and the concept of a dying and rising Messiah. He said in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, and, and by the way, the, the value of that would be, well, he inspires me to live a better life. I'm more kind, and so I, understood the, I understand the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, and so I'm good to everybody because Jesus lives in my heart. He didn't really come out of the grave. That's not possible, but he lives in my heart. Okay, that brand of Christianity has taken over lots of mainline denominations. Um, but no, uh, Paul, not in this place, Paul, Paul said, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. I mean, it's a big joke. <laughs> what Paul is saying is, if Jesus didn't bodily come out of that grave so that someday I can bodily come out of my grave, I'm out. This is not a philosophy of life. This is the reality and the only reality of, of, of life. So, that's what's at stake when we talk about when do we understand things figuratively, when do, you, when do we understand things literally. Um, and, and this started early on. There were two schools of thought of understanding the Bible in the first couple of centuries, the first three or four really. 
that really had influence. One was based in Antioch, uh, Antioch of Syria, which is the same church that sent out Paul and Barnabas. Now guess which view they held to, the literal or the figurative? Literal. The literal. But then in Alexandria, Egypt, which had a more philosophical bent, um, higher view of man, well guess which sense they usually took? Figurative. So they would flip this. They would say in every scripture, you've got to get beyond the mundane, common, everyday life stuff to the real deep spiritual meaning. Now here's the problem with that. If we don't let the literal sense of the words govern what those words mean, what, who becomes the authority of the meaning of Scripture? The reader. The reader. And boy, that's... So see this postmodern idea, this stuff is not... It's nothing new under the sun. Uh, so people like... Uh, they're called church fathers like Origen. He was in Alexandria. You read his stuff... Uh, and he'll, uh, I've got a, for, for my study of Romans, I got a copy of a book that just goes through Romans and gives commentary from early church fathers. Uh, so here, what Origen will do is he'll say, well, it says this, which on the surface of it means this. And that's usually pretty good because the words are clear and easy to understand. But then he'll say, but now here's what it really means. And then it goes off into all kind of places. It's like, origin, <laughs> you were doing good. Now you're off. Uh, but he had a big influence. He had a big influence. He, Roman Catholicism from, uh, of the Middle Ages, from, from 500 to 1500, I believe that the, the figurative, allegorical interpretation of Scripture is one of the things that allowed them to have such control and trust from people because when the, when the meaning of Scripture is not invested in the literal words that are there, but rather in the interpretation at the deeper spiritual levels. And, and, sometimes, and by the way, there were, there were some Hebrew, uh, some Jewish scholars like Philo and others in Alexandria, they had all kind of different ideas. The mainline idea usually, or at least one of the major ones was, well, we just read what it says and what it says is what it means. Uh, praise the Lord. But there were others who yielded, who had influence that, that yielded this stuff. But what, what ended up happening was basically the church able to say, look, you people can't even read. You don't have enough education to read. First of all, it was in Greek and Hebrew, but then we got the Vulgate, the Latin. And that really localized it, you know, because at the time Greek was actually a, a common language. That was the point. The Holy Spirit gave the New Testament in the common market language. It's not a high classical Greek. It's everybody could understand it. Most people that were educated at all. Well, the Roman Catholic Church were able to circle the wagons. We're going to do it in Latin. And uh, then, so then they alone could read it and were able to say to the people, all right, you can't even read it. We'll read it for you. And if, even if you could read it, you can't understand what it means because God has given to the church the authority to interpret it and to tell you. And that's what's frustrating in conversations I've had with, with good Catholics, with Catholics who know what they're talking about, what the doctrine is. They have a... It's almost like a pity toward me because it's just like the reason you don't agree with me is because you, you can't understand it because my church is the only one that can tell you the true meaning and you can't even understand it unless you get it from the true church, the Roman Catholic Church. So, now there are lots of bad Catholics who don't go that direction when we, and my bad Catholic, I mean, they just don't hold to what the Pope would say about that or the, you know, the Catholic catechism. And so they talk about spiritual things and I've had some good converse, gospel conversations with them. But when I'm talking to somebody who knows the doctrine, they know, well, you couldn't possibly understand this because you're outside the church. Um, praise God. God has given his, his word 
in words and they have meaning and we read the Bible in the same way that we have conversations with one another and that involves figures of speech you know if if uh, I was excited about Wit and Jack in their baseball game whatever and you said did they hit it good and I said hit it to the moon he hit it to the moon you would not think now wait a minute <laughs> I just, physics tells me that's not possible. You would know that I'm just saying he hit it hard and he hit it a long way. We understand that. Well, this, God has condescended to give us his word in human language. So we have a Bible written by ultimately God, but human writers. He's the author, they're the writers, is a good way to say it. And, and their personality, they use figures of speech. The Holy Spirit used their personalities, their, their, the human way of communicating. And that includes these things. So, so look at Rule 3.4. Um, well, let's just read all these. 3.2, use the figurative when, the, when explicitly directed to, like in dreams in Scripture. There's dreams and then there's an interpretation of dreams. Um, you remember Pharaoh's dream, seven, seven uh, skinny cows, seven fat cows, and the seven skinny cows eat the seven fat cows. So uh, Joseph didn't tell him, well, what that means is someday soon some cattle are going to come walking up out of the Nile. And that was not literal. That had a meaning that needed to be interpreted, and God gave it to him. And Pharaoh recognized Joseph as God is in his supernaturally helping you. So it meant that there were seven good years followed by seven famine years. So that's, that's a case of this. Consider the figurative when the literal is impossible or absurd. Rule 3.3. Um, out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. Okay, now look. It could be that there is something visible and tangible and objective about the word of God, the Lord Jesus, when he comes. Um, he may just speak the word and um, people fall, but it, I don't know. I mean, so this one, it's in absurd for one of us. I don't know what that will actually look like, so I don't know if that's the best example they give. Um, so, all right. Rule 3.4, consider the figurative when the literal meaning would violate a clear law of God. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. John 6.56. Um, that particular passage is interesting because in the Old Testament, when you eat something's blood, you're taking its life upon yourself. And so clearly there's prohibited prohibition mm -hmm. that more for ceremonial reasons. It probably helps you to do, but... Um, there's that, and then Jesus shows up on a scene and says, no, you need to do this. Mm -hmm. And in the, the, the Lutherans do take it literally. Mm -hmm. So the Catholics do. Right. And, uh, they, they take it very, it's, it's a tricky one. Because so, the, the point is, is take Jesus' life on. That's right. Have him be your stuff. Right. But it's just that, I, I thought it was interesting that they selected that one. Yep. And the thing is, when you look at, um, when you think about the room, at the the Lord's the Passover, which Jesus instituted, the Lord's Supper. So he was standing there with them and, and held up the bread. And what did he say? This is my body. Now, do you think the disciples got confused at that point? Now, now is this your body or is this your body? I don't think they did. I've, I mean, how many times have we done something like, okay... Uh, if you're playing a game and you need a strategy, you get in the dirt and you're all those are okay, here's you. Nobody goes, wait a minute. That's not me. This is me. So we know that. Okay, we, we understand that. Nobody's ever gotten confused in something like that. Uh, but yeah, it does, have a it does have a very deep meaning. But nobody walked up and started trying to gnaw on Jesus at that moment. Okay, nobody misunderstood him in that moment. All right. And I, just, I just think this this goes back to your first question: is you know what's the context? And then you look, you know, you look in the next in the next few verses, and Jesus says, "You know, the flesh counts for nothing; it's the spirit." Right, answer. right. That's true. He gives the he he helps set the, the 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 what the meaning is there. Okay. Consider the figurative when a literal interpretation would contradict another portion of scripture. 
Uh, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Mark 10, 25. Mark 10, 27. With man this is impossible, not with God. All things are possible with God. So Mark 10, 25 doesn't teach it's impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Mark 10, 25 clarifies that it is a task for God. Yeah, it's not ultimately impossible. Uh, it's, uh, and here's the truth. It's a supernatural event for any person to enter the kingdom of God because our sinful nature must be overcome. Uh, Jesus was highlighting in that instance when a wealthy person had just went aw gone away because he wasn't willing to give up his wealth. He pointed out wealth is a terrible obstacle. Uh, but then he said, well, you know, they asked, well, who can be saved? Well, with God, with God, everything is possible. All things possible. Okay. Now, on the other side, you have the figures of speech. This is just a list of different kinds. Uh, kind of already spent more time on this than I meant to, but but you can use that and look that and ask look at that. Ask the questions: How does the use of the figure of speech add to the meaning? Is the same or a similar figure of speech used elsewhere in the Bible? And if so, is there a relationship between the two passages? So. Uh, one that's very helpful, I think, in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 up there at hyperbole. Uh, a lot of people who argue that speaking in tongues should be normative uh, and that the gift of tongues is a heavenly language, an angelic language, they cite 1 Corinthians 13, 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So they say, see, it's possible to speak in the language of angels. Well, that's definitely not his point because he uses hyperbole in the next couple of statements. He says, if I had all knowledge and I had all faith to move mountains and I give my body to be burned, uh, now, he did <clears throat> some of all of that, <clears throat> but he didn't accomplish the full measure in any of it. I mean, he never knew everything, right? So he's saying, even if I had the ability to have all knowledge, but I didn't have love, I'd be near. even if I could speak in the language of angels. So he's, this does not establish, because he's using hyperbole in every one of the other uh, verses there that shows this is not teaching... It's normative for Christians to speak in the language of angels, which would cause great distress if, 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 that were, if that were true, because I'd be like, well, I can't. Why am I not speaking in the language of angels? How do I even know when it happens? Where can I hear an example of the language of angels? I mean, there's a lot of problems there, right? There's a lot of problems there. That's the big headache and heartache of the of charismatic. Right. It's, it sets a standard. You can't even measure it to know when you were there. When, when, am I there? I, even if something happens, was that the language of angels? I mean, we, don't, we can't even measure it. We don't know how. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, I got the flicker, so. Okay, let, let's read this just to clarify because at the Reasonable Questions Conference, I'm gonna, I want to read this to you. Did we read this last time? Out of King James? All right, I'm going to... You know, Paul Harmer at the Reasonable Questions Conference, in order to demonstrate the corruption of the New Testament, um, read, pointed out Matthew 20, 22 in the King James and then uh, read it from the ESV. And here's the, here's the two different, uh, different verses. Does anybody have it in King James? I have it. <laughs> well, I got it. I already got it. I'll go ahead and do that for sake of time. Matthew, and then if somebody wants to look up Matthew 20, 22 in the King James. Matthew 20, 22. Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. Okay, somebody have the ESV? Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, We are able. Okay, so one of the phrases that Jesus used, reference to the cup, the ESV includes. <clears throat> in the King James, it also includes a reference to, are you able to be baptized with the baptism with which I'm about to be baptized? So Harmer's point was, see, 
the modern, I, it's kind of hard to follow is what he was trying to say, but apparently he was saying that the New Testament, the integrity of the New Testament is gone. It's been corrupted because the ESV reads differently from the King James. The first thing is we're dealing with two different translations of the New Testament. We're not looking at the original book of Matthew. We're looking at two English translations in comparison, comparing them. So that means we're completely and utterly out of the category of dealing with the original book of Matthew. We're not able to compare these two things and make any comment at all on the integrity of the New Testament. Uh, and yet he gave this as evidence. So let me just explain. In Mark 10, 38, both the King James and the ESV, which is a parallel passage, the same, the same event. Uh, in the ESV, would somebody read Mark 10, 38? Whoever gets there first. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? Okay, so here's what's happened. In the original, in the earliest manuscripts, Mark gives us a fuller answer to uh, James and John's question. Mark gives a fuller answer. So if, if you're actually dealing with, let's compare the translations, you'd find that the ESV, the NIV, the New American Standard, all of the recognized modern translations include the phrase about baptism in Mark. And the reason they do is that all of the Greek manuscripts, virtually all of them, the evidence from the Greek manuscripts is that Mark recorded this phrase about bab being baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. Um, Matthew, the earliest manuscripts, uh, the best evidence is, and, um, because the earliest inclusion is later, uh, the conclusion was, it appears that a scribe somewhere in the process thought it'd be better if we give Mark's fuller answer in Matthew's account so that they're identical. Uh, but see, now that's where we have to say, that was wrong for that scribe to do that. He had good intentions, but then he caused the people who copied his and it disseminated and came to us then in the King James as if Matthew had originally written that. Cert and, and here's the issue. Copies, ancient copies of the New Testament in Matthew don't include that baptism phrase in Matthew, but they do in Mark. Now, they're either, if they're trying to take the phrase out for some reason, which there's really no reason to do it theologically, they're very poor at what they're doing, right? Because they left it in, in Mark's version, they took it out of Matthew. So here's the, the and by the way, the theological argument that was made that night was baptism is a very important saving ordinance. And we would never take that out. Well, what are we talking about here? Again, you go back to context here, even in the, in the King James. Uh, Matthew 20, back up two verses. Then came uh, to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. Uh, now, in the flow of Matthew, Jesus is telling them that he's going to have to suffer, and it's going to bring suffering on them. Um, and he's going to the cross. This has nothing to do with the ordinance of water baptism. It has absolutely nothing to do with it. And that's very clear to see. I think for the Mormons, they don't understand how translations really work. For them, the Book of Mormon was written in 1820 or so. And since then, they've had a pretty much linear progression of revisions and edits and things that are sanctioned by their church to get them to where they are now, which is boom, 
although they build off each other. They never think about going back to the original manuscript. We don't have it, but you know. And but for us, we all go back to the original manuscript as far as we can, okay, and compare, contrast, and try to create the closest English translation in the modern English parlance to the uh, original translations. And they can't fathom that idea. They, in order for um, I can't remember his name, but for his argument to work, there would have had to have been a progression from King James to ESV directly. Like the ESV was drawing off the King James, and therefore that line was deleted, and therefore that's a problem. Right. Yeah. But that's not how it was done. No, that's a good point. Every translation, the effort is to go directly back to the original. It's not, uh, well, actually, the King James, they actually did. Uh, use English, the Bishop's Bible, and it's a kind of revision of the Bishop's Bible, which there's no ro nothing wrong with consulting those things, but um, but that's you're right. That's not how translation is going back to the original and putting it into. It's not a it's not an edit of a current yeah, I translation. Really get that. I, I agree. Understand. I agree. All right, now we've got a few minutes left, and I told you last time that you could bring a passage if you wanted to. We got some other stuff to cover to help us deal with passages, but we'll save that to, to next week. So does anybody have a passage that you really wanted us to look at and answer the, the questions for? Or am I on my own? You're on your own. <laughs> anybody have a passage? All right. Um, here's, here's a translation issue. In the King James, bear you one another's burdens. Three verses later, every man shall bear his own burden. <laughs> so does the Bible teach that we should bear one another's burdens or that each person should bear his own burden? This demonstrates the value of good translations oops, and access to the original languages. Okay? This is a, why it's a good idea it, it, either to be uh, able to use the tools in Hebrew and Greek, which is not as accessible to everybody, don't panic, or just have several different translations that you look at for each verse. Okay? When you, when you, when you understand, like, say you don't want to, you don't, un, you're not able to use Greek, that's fine. The ESV translators were, and they rendered the first Occasion burdens from the Greek baros, which means burden, weight, or fullness in Galatians 6.2. And then in Galatians 6.5, it says load, uh, and that's the Greek fortion, which is used to refer to a man's pack or a soldier's kit. So I'm told this then in Galatians, that when there is a burden, a weight, a fullness to that, when it's a huge thing and I need help, that we're to help each other with that. And then in order to be able to help one another, we each have the responsibility to carry our own pack. Uh, it's the difference in um, one person trying to carry a piano and a group of five men trying to carry that red bag right there. Okay, both of those are absurd, aren't they? You need a group of people to try to carry a piano, and you need one person and not two trying to carry a backpack. I mean, just to try for two people to carry a backpack. And yet, we do have things where people are asking for assistance where the solution is, well, actually, you need to handle that. And this is a one-man job. <laughs> there are things that are just one-person jobs. And if you don't even do that, then it creates a problem. Sure. Um, we had, we, I studied Galatians in a women's Bible study probably 20 years ago. And the speaker, I wrote her quote in my Bible um, in regards to this, these verses. And she said, um, I will never, never do for someone what God intends for them to do for themselves. So, it's, it's important to recognize when somebody has a burden in verse 2 versus a burden in verse 5. 
Mm -hmm. You know, if, they ha if they're trying to carry a piano, yes, go and help them. Mm -hmm. But if they have their backpack on and they're struggling, God wants them to mm -hmm. carry that themselves. We can encourage, we can, and the other, the, the other side of that is if some people in the congregation have a piano they're trying to carry, I'm, if I'm over here asking y'all to help me carry my backpack, I'm not in position to even try to help the person carrying the thing that needs multiple people to help with. So, you know, and we need to stay qualified to help each other. Okay, so I'm going to give you this thought and we're going to stop. Um, we'll start here with this next time. But in the, the book, Living by the Book, that Hendrix and Hendrix wrote, they, they gave 10 strategies to first rate reading. Um, and we've got them all here. Read thoughtfully, repeatedly, patiently, selectively, prayerfully imaginatively and that doesn't mean whatever you imagine it to be that means be able to put yourself in the context put yourself in the context meditatively purposely acquisitively and I had to read to see what they meant they mean to in order to acquire don't read it as a sacramental um, today I have read the Bible I will be blessed I don't remember what it said but the reading by the working of the work of reading the Bible it, it's just kind of a uh, superstitious uh, like people in Latin America they had Bibles if they had well if they had one they would put it up on the top the highest place in their house they didn't read it they just had it. Well, don't treat reading the Bible like that. Did you read your Bible? Yes, I did. I'm right, I'm right where I need to be. What did it say? I don't know. <laughs> See, that, that's what it means to read. Acqui acquire it. Read for the purpose of acquiring the meaning. And read telescopically, which means there is, even though it's 66 different books, there is one theme, one story, one message that is unified from Genesis all the way to Revelation and, and read with that in mind. Read the part, but know that it fits in the whole. Okay? We'll, we'll review those and talk a little bit more about those to start next time and, and then uh, get into some other strategies of, of reading. And then what we're going to do, just to give you a little road map, we'll finish up kind of the questions zooming in on a passage and we'll start thinking about putting that this exegesis and this hermeneutics into that flow that we talked about God the Bible exegesis and hermeneutics biblical theology systematic theology and practical theology and I'll give you some examples of how being relentless to keep those categories in order uh, has helped me uh, and, and help me arrive at some conclusions, okay? Well, and, and if you do think of a passage that you want us to deal with with these questions together, come in here with it. And this is, this is one of the things I love about the Bible, the nature of the Bible, the clarity of the Bible, the, uh, the perspicuity of the Bible. That means you can, you can apprehend meaning is that we can just say that, you know? I don't, I can't imagine a Hindu saying, you know, if you got a passage from the Bhagavad Gita or the Vedas, come in and we'll work through what it means. It's, you, it's not even possible. It's not even accessible. Uh, but the Bible is objective and it communicates. And we can do that. We can do that. It's a reason that it's good and right uh, for, to be a part of a ministry that distributes the Bible <laughs> around the world like the Gideons do. So, well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll have some fellowship before we begin our, our service. Lord, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you that we can, that you have condescended to, to communicate to us in our language, in human language, that we can look into your word and be instructed. And that when we find problems, like in Galatians 6, to simply apply some work the way we would any other communication, uh, we discover meaning. And it's, it's, it's logical and objective. And we can apply it. Thank you for that, Lord. How loving and gracious you are.
to instruct us in this way. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Mike.